welcome again to another program of Searching for Answers, a program designed to help you, as well as all of us here on the panel, to better understand the Bible. With me tonight are some very distinguished people, and I'm here to ask questions, because I don't know the answers, but I try. On my right is... It doesn't guarantee that we know the answers either, <laughs> but we'll try to be distinguished about it okay. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> John Jones, La Sierra University. Bernard Taylor, Loma Linda University Church. Ivan Blazin, School of Religion, Loma Linda University. Now, if you gather your Bibles, as I said before, and go to 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, and we sort of danced around chapter mm -hmm, 10 mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask my good friend sitting right here beside me hey, just give me a little rundown and then we'll start in oh, I think verse 32 in mm, chapter yeah. 10 okay fine okay yes well um, we had been looking at the examples that Paul draws from the history of the Israelites as they wandered in the desert on mm -hmm. route from Egypt to the promised mm -hmm. land and um, the fact that they tempted God, even though they were all blessed with the same blessings, they ate the same manna, drank the same water, but nonetheless they were fractious. There was disagreement among them, and that they, it says here that they actually tried God's patience, really, and uh, God had, uh, uh, had to actually exert some stringent uh, corrections on them, as we know. But, but the point is in verse 6 that all these things come to us as examples so that we might not follow after evil as mm -hmm. they did and that in the course of so doing we are especially admonished in verse 14 to turn aside from idolatry. Paul in some ways like many ancient Jews sees the worship of idols as really the wellspring out of which must, most if not all evil uh, arises somehow because it it dethrones God. It puts something or someone else in the place of the divine. And Paul is concerned lest the uh, Corinthians find themselves doing the same thing. Um, even in their religious rituals in the name of Christ, it is possible for them to uh, to violate the sanctity of the ceremonies and the meanings that attend it. So not only in 10, but as we go on into 11, we're going to see why Paul is so concerned about this. Because he's going to say, th this is the reason that m there are dissensions among you, and yes, even physical illnesses as well. Yeah. May I mention something along that line? Sure, our, go ahead. Review here? Uh, it mentions in verse 2 that all these Israelites were baptized into Moses. Now, Chapter... Uh, chapter 10. Okay, verse, verse 2. two okay. says that they were all baptized into Moses. Mm -hmm. And right away that recalls the fact that Christians are baptized into Christ. So, th But they had baptism. And they all drank of the same uh, spiritual drink and ate the same spiritual food. So this is a reminiscence of in, the, in Israel's history it had the equivalent of the Lord's Supper. So they had, as it were, baptism and the Lord's Supper. But these things, as good as they are, do not guarantee fidelity yeah. to God. Mm -hmm. They are expressions of our fidelity to God, but you can misuse them and so on. And th I think they were feeling very secure. Why, we have baptism. We have the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. We are saved. <laughs> we're going to make it no matter what. And this says, wait a minute. Israel had all that. Look what happened to them. Yeah. They had wonderful blessings and privileges. That's right. But they fell in the wilderness, thousands of them, thousands of them. It's a reminder to us that any symbol... Any enactment, any sacred building, any ceremony can be perverted. Exactly. Can right. be sullied and bent in a wrong direction and can become grounds of false pride and false security, can't it? Yeah. yeah. It's fascinating to me in the epistles, for the longest time, I saw them as, you know, somehow doctrinal, as, as yeah. was, was common to do. <clears throat> but what has come to impress me now is the story that lies behind the book. It's not something that is abstracted and he's not writing a manual for general Christian use. Mm -hmm. He's writing to a particular church which mm -hmm. is early mm -hmm. on his second missionary journey when he's now on his own in terms of Barnabas 
and he's going across over into Europe for the first time, and he comes to Corinth. Yeah. And he set out in terms of what I think we would call an evangelist, and Corinth is making him a pastor, even yeah. after he's moved yeah. on. And those of us in ministry know what it's like to have a church like this. And, and it's just the nature of it. It can be frustrating, but it's also an opportunity to grow. And without this, there is so much that we would be without. If everything went smoothly in Corinth, perhaps we wouldn't have access mm. to this information. Oh, if they didn't do the things they did, we wouldn't have this letter. You're quite <laughs> right. And we're glad for this letter. But I, I think if they could rise up, they would say, we are very unhappy that you are reading our letter <laughs> to our church for the entire world. You know, they wouldn't like that exposure. I have I a question think. here. Uh, chapter 10, when it says, They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud yeah. and in the sea, yeah. going through the sea. Yeah. That doesn't mean individually. They all went through the sea. A corporate experience. Yeah, and they were <coughs> also ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. Right. Now, what about nowadays? We don't do things that way anymore, do we? Well, we all eat the same spiritual food. I, uh, one of the things that impressed me when I became an Adventist, I used to be a Catholic and um, enjoyed uh, that service, but what impressed me when I became an Adventist, it really did impress me, was that everyone took the bread at the, and ate it at the same time. In the Catholic Mass, and, and I'm not speaking negatively now, mm. uh, there's these individual dispensings mm -hmm. of the bread, and each one it takes it down individually. But here we all did it together. together. And then we drank the, the wine together. together. And I got a sense of community out of that that, mm -hmm. that was hard to get out of the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And you see, if we push the, the imagery here, we can say, well, if this was baptism, it was dry cleaning because, <laughs> but they went <laughs> through the water. <laughs> went into a desert. <laughs> dry cleaning. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> but Only they went, Bernard could say something yeah. like that. They went through the water. Yeah, yeah. And because it was an cloud. experience. Yeah. And looking yes. back in the light of the New Testament and the reality of baptism, they had a similar experience. Yes. Yeah. But behind even that is how in Corinth they would know these stories. Have they been told these stories? Yeah. Or are these synagogue uh, or, or uh, Gentile mm -hmm. believers who are mm -hmm. proselytes in the in the con the uh, synagogue, but there is an assumption, and they themselves are making these claims, perhaps in relation to wisdom or something like that. And now Paul is applying it to Christianity. Yeah. Well, notice yeah. what he says in harmony. That he says, uh, Which verse? "I don't, I don't want you." Verse one. Oh. I don't want you to be ignorant. Yeah. When it's he says that, that means I'm going to give you information. Yeah, it's a conventional expression, but it may be that he's saying, I want to really cover the bases and make sure that all of you, uh, who you may or may not have heard this before, yeah. I don't want you ignorant, I want you all aware of That's the right. details here. So he has previously said, you know, you get food offered to idols in the markets, you buy that food, you know, don't be hung up about that, uh, eat it without question. Mm -hmm. But to sit at the table mm. in a temple, yeah, and eat at, a, at a, a pagan banquet, now he's beginning to say that begins to edge over into idolatry and paganism much more clearly, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. And I don't want you to be uh, partners with demons. Yeah. Um, the ceremony doesn't save you. It's not magic. He's saying that, you know, even the Israelites could go against the They probably blessing. thought of it magical. Yeah, they, but mm. they did. That's right. <coughs> but you can't sit at the table of the Lord and the table of demons uh, and, mm. uh, and kind of think that they're all equal the same thing. You're just prof profaning uh, God's banquet in that case. I think one of the most important verses in this flow of thought is verse 12. You know. And it, mm. <clears throat> so if you think you are standing, you're, yeah. You stand. You're yeah. strong. This is verse 12. You're, you have the assurance of your salvation, which all of us should have, yeah. but you're really standing there. Don't get overconfident in this way where you're dabbling with idolatry and think you're still going to stand. Watch out that you do not fall. Yeah. Yes. So we, we can have assurance, but only as those who will be tempted. Yeah. 
See, the, I think they thought they were beyond the reach yes. Yeah. Yes, of yeah. genuine temptation, yeah. see? Yeah. They weren't. I think they thought that. You're right, Ivan. And, and verse 23 may echo that. Here are the words of these people. Mm. Paul is quoting them back to them now. <coughs> this is not Paul's invention. This is their slogan. Yeah, everything's, everything's available to us. Everything's okay. It's all all right. Everything's all lawful. lawful, you see, yeah. permissible. He says it twice. But he says, yeah, but not everything builds up. Not everything's beneficial. Yeah. So look out. That's yeah, right. Look out. Lest you get too kind of complacent within your own kind of vaunted spiritual maturity. Now you, know? you yeah. said it exactly. You've yeah. caught the spirit of the Corinthians. <laughs> yeah. Art thou a Corinthian, my friend? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is that we're the way we they are, were? We are well, all potentially uh -huh. Corinthians. Yeah. That's, that's right. The point. Yeah. That, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are. Yeah. And, um, you know, verse 26 may pick up on it again. The earth and the fullness thereof, all the Lord's. Now, Paul quotes that from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the Psalms. But, but nonetheless, he can say, yes, so in the marketplace, whatever's there, don't quibble over that. But when it's a ritual situation, a, a ceremonial context that's involving the worship of idols, then there's a subtle shift that takes place in all of this. Is this a distinction between idols on the one hand, yeah. <coughs> which don't, which are nothing but idolatry? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's right. Exactly. And I idolatry will set them a back to where they were. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think you you hit it on the head. That's right. So, but the, isn't it doesn't it come quite surprising in a way? He says an idol is nothing. Yeah. He says there really isn't an idol God. There's no God behind it. And yet, he says in verse 20, no, what I imply is that what, they, what the pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons mm -hmm. and not to God. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you partners to demons. So idolatry involves us in the demonic. There are powers there. It may not be the gods they thought of, but there's something spiritually negative about this whole thing. Yes. 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 There are still countries today where Christians, including people who share our own denominational allegiance, who struggle with these issues because, first of all, the marketplaces do have food that's been offered in the morning to this, that, or another divinity in the hopes of a good business day, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it raises issues for some of our fellow believers. Well, it would raise issues for Jews, wouldn't it? For Especially. sure. Not for only sure. would they want to avoid pork and things like that, anything. but they would want to avoid anything associated with idolatry. Mm -hmm. And every day of every week of every month of every year was yeah. dedicated to a different yeah. God. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> How does a Jew live in that context? Exactly. How does he live? So where does he come out now? He's got to slice this thing pretty <laughs> thinly, doesn't yes. he? Huh? This is a, this is a tightrope here, isn't it? On the one hand, eat whatever is set before you, okay, verse what, 27. What, what verse are we uh, in? 27, yeah. Okay. You know, uh, you're at a meal. Someone, you know, someone has you their house. You're served. Yeah, no, don't fuss. But if someone says to you, maybe the person sitting beside mm. you, oh, by the way, I want to let you know, this, uh, this has been through the temple. It's been offered. Oh, well, in that case, uh, for out of respect for others people's conscience, not yours, you know, mm -hmm. he says, you know, just, just abstain. Well, is it implicit yeah. in here that the one who raised that objection, hey, Paul, the, or whoever, mm -hmm. this was offered, uh, you know, in sacrifice to a pagan guy, uh, that uh, they yeah. wouldn't eat themselves? Yeah. Were they going to abstain from it, the one who raises this question? I believe mm -hmm. that Paul means it, that they would say it in such a way. Yeah. I think Paul is saying that they themselves are, f are uh, abjuring, you know, st stepping so in other back words, from it. So in other words, we yeah. have in this congregation then, as we've seen before, the strong who yeah. can do anything. Mm -hmm. Then we have the more weak, <coughs> the more, uh, no, I don't want to call them legalistic, but the more tender conscience and yeah. a little bit more yeah. guilt-ridden type yeah. persons. So they, they have a concern. Well, it's very interesting what he says in verse 29 yes. and, and following. He says, I'm talking about the other person's conscience, not your own. Mm -hmm. Your mm -hmm. conscience is clear, yeah. but their conscience isn't. Yeah. And so that is the lead up to two verses that I think are often very much misunderstood. Mm. And that's 29 and 30 where it says yeah. in the middle of 29, 
For why should my liberty be subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? And or yet he's saying it is. A repeat. <laughs> yeah, that's well, right. that's the point. Yeah, right. A lot of people say, See they there? isolate this. Yeah. And they say, look, I don't want my liter liberty to be determined by someone else's conscience. Yeah. And Paul says, that's right. So don't eat, and then it won't be. Yeah. No <laughs> one will judge you. Yeah, no yeah, one yeah. will denounce yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. the freedom, but they don't understand it. No one will denounce you for what you don't do. In this context. Give an example in this day and age. We're, we're back there in Bible times. What would oh, you let's, say? Let's take a, one that really won't step on any toes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we don't, we don't, we're not have hang-ups about this, but we did at one point. Um, bowling. Bowling. Not innocent enough activity. Sure. Um, bowling alleys are not necessarily always the most uplifting places, but uh, hey, roll a ball down I always roll it down the gutter. So <laughs> roll it down the gutter. That's very bad. <laughs> I don't think that's Doesn't the way you're right. supposed to play the game. <laughs> <clears throat> it's nothing. It's nothing. New and I both know it's nothing. Ah, but there were times and places in our own denominational history where people were genuinely offended that one of their church members and brothers or sisters would go to a bowling alley and mm -hmm. go bowling. Mm -hmm. And simply blowing that off and saying, hey, that's their hang-up, not mine, is really yeah. insensitive and I think ultimately unchristian by Paul's standard. Well, Paul would say, yeah. bowling is probably say that bowling is okay, but it is never okay to use your freedom yeah. in such to, a way uh, yeah, that the, it, it hurts someone else's conscience. That's and, right. And so a new definition of freedom comes out of this. Yeah. Genuine freedom is being able to not use your that's freedom. Right. Yeah. Uh, the person that has to use his freedom is not free. free. <laughs> yeah. So this is not a contradiction of, but an affirmation of 8.11. So by, by your knowledge, those weak believers yeah. whom Christ died are destroyed. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. Uh, if food is the cause of my falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Yeah, there's often been, what, usually there is a contrast between these two and... and both of you are making an important Okay, distinction tell me here. again, in simple language, the freedom... Genuine freedom <laughs> is the freedom not to do what your conscience approves. Okay, it because hurts it hurts somebody else. If it hurts someone else. It would be strange not to use your freedom if, if it's unproblematic, but it is problematic if someone somehow can't understand it. I think we've got to understand that the, that the weaker person somehow will be led to do what you are doing and then will have guilt. And that's chapter 8. Mm. And then is w that's where you would be doing wrong. Yeah. This is not about legalists who wouldn't do what you're doing under any circumstance. They'll just judge you for it. See, yeah. it's not about that. Isn't, didn't we come across a verse that said, if mm. you use your freedom mm -hmm. but cause somebody to lose faith in Christ, then it's your, you are yeah. a sinner. That's 1 Corinthians 8. 1 yeah. Corinthians yeah, 8. Yeah, you're there. So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is, this is um, you just cited something from 1 Corinthians 8. Those believers for whom Christ died. Those brothers and sisters. Yeah. Right. Uh, how do you define a brother or a sister? And I think that's a good definition. That is a person for whom Christ died. He Which came to heal them, yeah. mm -hmm. and you now would hurt them? Yeah. That's sort of the, the, the appeal in that. And this isn't the impasse that it seems to be. Yeah. Now, mm. uh, for, some time, for some it becomes that, and the, the weaker conscience is determinative. I think it's important we not violate conscience, but it is also possible to re-educate conscience. Yeah, you could and hope that's for how that. it moves, can I move so. forward. That's an important thing. Otherwise, the church is always in thrall to its weaker brothers and sisters forever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Ivan, uh, as you know, out of the Roman tradition, Roman Catholic tradition, <coughs> the conscience of the believer is the ultimate guide to faith and practice. But they go on to say it must be the educated conscience. Oh, yeah, it's instructed. Yeah. yeah. It is the instructor. And I, I, think, I think, Bernard, that's exactly <coughs> the point that mm. you're making. And it's one yes. that we need to remember. Yes. Uh, churches grow, people grow, truth grows. 
insight and understanding grows, conscience grows in a way. Well, know, it does. You know. It's not fully formed. Yeah. I have a book at home, and this is a little off the subject maybe, but it's about gangs in L.A. Mm -hmm. And it is about some of those gangs, they can kill without conscience. Yeah. There are no pangs of guilt. There is no feeling of something terrible. I've just done something terrible. It's just like like eating or drinking or anything. Blinking you your eye. Blinking mm. your eye. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, the, the whole point then, isn't it, uh, in verse 31? So whatever mm -hmm. you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God. So there's a, there's a vertical relationship. Do everything to the glory of God. And on the horizontal relationship, give no offense to Jews or Greeks or the church of God, just mm. as I try to please everyone and everything, not seeking my advantage, but that of the many. So we have two responsibilities, both to God and to human beings. Okay, can I read verse 31 well, sure. uh, on a ways? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews Greeks or the Church of God. Even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I know as I follow the example of Christ. He's saying, be careful what you do in front of your brother. Your brother may not approve of something, and you feel perfectly it doesn't bother your conscience you feel your freedom but it causes somebody maybe to lose their faith in Jesus yeah well then you're held responsible right. even though you're free right don't you see in verse uh, 33 a cross sitting right in verse 33 oh, yeah. I try to please everyone and everything not seeking my own advantage when Christ went to the cross he really wasn't seeking his own advantage. Mm -mm. This was a very difficult thing to do, even for him. But he was seeking our advantage. That's the Christian life, is it not? Yeah, but That's for how the we love good our of many. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that is an important, critical, crucial point. The cross is crucial, <laughs> literally. <laughs> but here's Paul using language that people have accused him of. I try to please everyone in everything. Oh, they went after and they him. Say, oh, he's a man pleaser. Yep. He does what everybody wants, and he has different uh, positions and attitudes uh, depending on whose company he's in for his own per but it's for his personal benefit. Paul says, I do this not for my benefit, but for the sake of the gospel. Well, he, what, you, what you said, he says in chapter 9. Yeah. Yeah. He says, <laughs> verse 19. Could yeah. we look at that, chapter yeah. 9, yeah. verse 19? Go ahead and read it. Okay. Uh, for though I am free with respect to all, I've made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. This is kind of strange to hear Paul the Jew say this. Mm -hmm. But to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, that's also the Jew, I became as one under the law, though I'm not myself under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, the Gentiles, I became as one outside the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that I might by all means save, save some. some. And I do I it all for the sake of the gospel. That is a very important verse. Isn't that? Whether, no matter what I do, I do for all, because he doesn't want to make anybody else stumble. Mm. That's incredible, given who Paul was <laughs> and the leadership in the church. Yeah, yeah. Talk about servant leadership. Yeah. That mm -hmm. <coughs> just such a humility and a love and concern yeah. for mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. By nature, he could be such an irascible character. Yes, he? that's but, what I was thinking. Yeah. This is what the gospel does to people. Yes, mm? <laughs> yes. Mm. Well, the Sabbath school lessons right now are about mission, and this certainly is a theology of mission. Sure is. You know? Mm. All right, shall we go on yeah. into the next chapter? Well, just before that, I just want to... Okay, where are you? Underline 11.1. Mm. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Mm. Yeah. A lot of people have misunderstood that, but oh, yeah. here is the Christian church 
just beginning. Exactly. What does it mean to be a Christian? And Paul is confident in his, his service and in his humility to be able to say, let me serve as a guide, as a bridge <coughs> from the known to the unknown. Mm -hmm. And, and I know in my father's ministry, particularly we were, we're, when we're in more isolated areas, people had no idea what it meant to become a Christian. And of course, in the 21st century, that's only much more the case. And to have that example, knowing that it w he will not mislead you, mm -hmm. that there is the humility, there are the quirks and those sorts of things. There is that underlying, undying yeah. recognition of the love of Christ and what difference that has made in the life of Paul. He never forgot that. Right. Well, some people have charged Paul with that gigantic word megalomania. He's just filled with himself. But it isn't that way at no. all. He says, no. imitate me. Uh, that's where they get the offense. Right. That he would actually ask people to imitate him but as I imitate Christ. Yes. And for the sake of people who don't, can't see Christ, wouldn't know him, so, there's got to be an example someplace, and I'm trying to be that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Paul's trying to let out the air and the tires of the Corinthians. <laughs> 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 they On that note, of, we yeah. only have a he few says they seconds were, left. He says they were puffed up. And um, <laughs> so I want to tell us, ask everybody to read along with us as we continue on in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In the meantime, you might read ahead of time and see if you could come to some understanding mm. before you hear us Good. in our next service. In the meantime, this is Carolyn Thompson for Searching for Answers. <laughs> 